Latvia, as well as for other countries created after the First World War, the previous hundred years have been the time to learn to stand, to walk, to run, maybe sometimes to dance. And this is, right now, the right moment to start flying. It is impossible to fly with a full speed without sound economic, political and cultural foundations. Why have some countries been more successful in economy? How uh, to provide strong political leadership? What can we learn today from our cultural heritage? And these are very questions I hope we will found at least partly answers today during our discussions at the conference. So I invite you to actively participate in discussions, to share your opinions and to build our future because we build Europe ourselves right here and right now. And it is my great honor and pleasure to give the floor to address the audience to Prime Minister Maris Kuczynskis. Man ir ļoti liels prieks dot vārdu mūsu ministru prezidenta Mārim Kučinskim. Godājamie konferences dalībnieki, dāmas un kungi. Pirms simts gadiem beidzās pirmais pasaules karš un uz sabrukušo impēriju drupām radās desmit jaunas Eiropas valstis. Tas bija arī neatkarīgās Latvijas dzimšanas laiks. Pirmais pasaules karš Latvijā atstāja dziļas un traģiskas pēdas. Latvijas iedzīvotājs skaits saruka par vairāk nekā 35% no 2,5 miljoniem 1914. gadā līdz nepilniem 1,6 miljoniem 1900. 20. gadā. Tik sagrauta rūpniecība un iznīcināta infrastruktūra. Tomēr Latvijas tautai pietika spēka un apņēmības izcīnīt brīvību un uzcaut savu valsti, kura atrada savu vietu Eiropas valstu saimē. Šodien Latvija vēl pēc viena gara un traģiska savu vēsturas posma no jauna ir atradusi savu vietu Eiropā, kļūstot par Eiropas Savienības un NATO dalību valsti. Respektējot manai uzrunāju piešķirto laiku, runāšu tikai par pašu galveno. Par principiem, kam ir jābūt mūsu darbības pamatā, lai valsts Eiropa, Eiropas Savienība būtu stabila un ilgspējīga. Atskatoties nesanā un arī sanākā Latvijas vēsturē, Varētu teikt, ka mūsu darbības pamatā ir bijis brīvības principis. Domāju, ar to var lepoties un būt pateicīgi iepriekšējām paudzēm par šī principa uzturēšanu. Bez tā nebūtu bijis Baltijas ceļa, bez tā mēs nebūtu atgriezušies Eiropā. Šodien mūsu paudzes pienākums ir iet tālāk uz priekšu. Tādēļ es vēlos izvirzīt trīs vēlēt kas būtu svarīgi Latvijai, kopā ar pārējām valstīm, veidojot Eiropas nākotni. Svarīgi uzreiz piebilst, ka mēs nesākam tukšā vietā. Pagājušā gada martā Romā visas 27 Eiropas Savienības dalību valstis pauda apņēmību, turpināt attīstīt, uzlabot Eiropas projektu, ieklausīties Eiropiešu viedokļos un bažās. Priecājos, ka arī Latvijā notika padziļinātas diskusijas ar iedzīvotājiem par Eiropu. Tagad par principiem. Pirmkārt, Eiropas nākotas veidošanā svarīgas būtu solidaritātes principis. Šis pamatprincips priekšplānā ļautu izvirzīt nevienlīdzības samazināšanu Eiropas Savienībā, Nevienlīdzības samazināšana ir nepieciešama, lai neveidotos privileģēto kastu. Tas ir tā saucamie globalizācijas ieguvēji, un otrā pusē ļauža masas, kas jūtas kā globalizācijas zaudētāji. Tiek minēts, ka tieši tā piedalījās balsojumā par Brexit. Ar solidaritātes principu cieši saistīts ir konverģents princips. Tas nozīmē aizvien lielāku tuvināšanos starp atšķirīgajiem. 
tā tas skanētu latviski. Satraucoši, ka Eiropas komisija vienā no saviem dokumentiem par Eiropas nākotni ir konstatējusi, ka konverģence Eiropas Savienībā ir apstājusies. Vēl satraucošāk, ka netiek piedāvāts skaidrojums, kāpēc finanšu un ekonomikas krīze. Katrā ziņā skaidrs, ka Latvijas interesēs ir harmoniska Eiropas teritorijas attīstība un asimetrija koriģēšana. Tāpēc būtiski loma ir kohēzijas politikai, par ko mēs cīnāmies. Būtiska loma ir arī priekšlikumam veidot Eiropā universitāšu tīklus, kas tuvinātu Eiropas jauniešus un līdz ar to arī mūs visus. Taču vai ar to pietiek, lai koriģētu asimetrijas Eiropas Savienības attīstībā? Iespējams, par to varētu kompetences priest šīs konferences otrais panelis. Konverģence var apskatīt arī plašākā nozīmē. Mums visiem Eiropā būtu jāvēltī papildus pūles, lai pārvarētu domstarpības, mazināt šķevšanos un veicināt vienotību. Ir runa par kopsaucēju meklēšanas starp dalību valstību, un tas, saprotams, nav vienkārši. Latvijai ir primāri svarīgi noturēt Baltijas valstu vienotību. Interesanti, ka šo vienotību savā ziņā nosaka ārpusi. ASV prezidents tikās ar visu trīs Baltijas valstu prezidentiem kopā, tikšanās ar Francijas valsts vadītāju arī bija šādā formātā. Tātad ārpa saule mūs redz kopā. Arī mēs paši var teikt, ka Eiropas Savienības jaunā budžeta jautājumos mēs kopā ar igauņiem un lietuviešiem Esam izstrādājuši jau vairākas kopīgas dokumentas, esam arī runājuši viens otru vārdā, un šī metode darbojas – atstāja iespaidu, saliedē mūs. Skatoties mazliet tālāk, svarīgi ir turpināt kopt Baltijas un Ziemeļvalstu vienotību. Un visbeidzot trešais princips, kas būtu svarīgs, domājot par mūsu kopīgo Eiropas nākotni, ir – kritiskās domāšanas principus. Tas ir svarīgs demokrātijas pamatprincips, to starp meklējot zāles pret populismu. Ir zināms, ka latviešu uz lietām raugās ar veselīgu skepsi, arī ar piesardzību. Skaidrs, ka mums Eiropas Savienībā būtu nepieciešams stiprināt spējas kritiski izvērtēt lietas un notikumus, piemēram, mēdīju telpā. Arī politikas vidē tas ir aktuāli, lai saprast, kurš piedāvā politiku un kurš populismu. Kritiskās domāšanas attīstīšana varētu būt interesanta tēma ne tikai pirmajām konferences panelim, bet arī trešajām, jo kas gan šo domāšanu attīsta, ja ne kultūra, literatūra, māksla, filozofija. Protams, ir trīs principi, kas būtu svarīgi Latvijai kopā ar citām Eiropas valstīm, veidojot Eiropas nākotni, nav vienīgie. Katram no jums un katram no šodienas paneļiem noteikti būs savi. Aicinu par tiem diskutēt, kā arī neaizmirst koncentrēties uz to, ko varam dot Eiropai un mūsu kopīgai nākotnē tajā. Igaunijas prezidents Lennārts Merī kādā uzrunā esot sacīs, mazo valstu loma ir būt par Eiropas līdzsvara barometru. Mazās valstis var būt apgrūtinājums, taču tās ir Eiropas līdzsvara turētājs. Ja Eiropā nebūtu mazo valstu, lielvalstīm būtu tās jāizdomā. Viņam var tikai piekrist. Paldies! Latvijas face in Europe, one of the Latvian faces in Europe, is Valdis Dambrovskis, who invested in tremendous amount of work in the past, tackling the economic crisis and putting Latvia back on track and forwards to Eurozone. This example of uh, very successful crisis management is now part of historical textbook lessons, even for students, but also for politicians, and not only in Latvia, but around the globe. 
I am pleased to introduce Vice President of the European Commission, Valdis Dombrovskis. The floor is yours, Valdis. Honorable Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the 100-year anniversary of independence provides with an occasion to think of how far our countries have uh, come since and why. Uh, all countries which gained their independence a century ago have their own stories, but their histories have often moved in parallel. We can learn and draw lessons from each other's experiences across all ten countries. And though we celebrate the past, this is a discussion about the future. Each of us is determined to steer our own course, especially those who spent uh, half a century in dependence, in voluntary chained to the Soviet Union. Take Latvia and Finland. Both had similar levels of development before the World War II. It makes the distinction clear. Our economic development under communist rule reads like one giant missed opportunity. This makes us all eager to make up the lost time. We continue to build on our hard-won independence. Strategic alliances safeguard, complement, and reinforce our sovereignty. We are fully fledged, well-respected, and active members of the United Nations, NATO, the European Union, and Euro area. At the core of Europe is where we belong. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe is not only a political union. Especially for us in the Baltic states, it is inextricably linked with the economic opportunities that come from being part of the world's largest single market. The question is how to make most of that. Our success has come with ups and downs, but most importantly with the lessons we drew from it. The history of Latvian economy shows that our strength lies with our people. Since the 19th century, Latvia's well-educated population has contributed to rapid industrial development. It made us perform very well during the independence period between the world wars. As an example, in 1938, Latvia's GDP per capita was slightly higher than Finland's and almost twice that of Poland. And Latvia had the biggest share of higher education students in Europe. After regaining independence, we had to rebuild our country and move from a crumbling common economy to a functioning market economy. Importantly, the prospect of the European Union membership provided the momentum for transformation we set to achieve. But our path has not been smooth. Since independence, we have gone through the 1995 uh, banking crisis, 1998 Russia crisis, and were severely affected by global financial and economical crisis. Apart from international partnerships, strengthening our own institutions and economy is a way to deal with such shocks. Uh, our approach on, uh, uh, on the financial crisis was a case in point. Tackling it head-on rather than uh, avoid difficult questions proved to uh, be the right way to overcome the crisis. The financial crisis brought out the imbalances that had been building up in our economy for years. Latvia's succession to the EU was a strong stimulus for economic development. Dynamic growth fueled by cheap loans, massive investment, and a rapid increase in real wages led to unsustainable raise in demand and caused the uh, Latvian economy to overheat. Between 2005 and 2007, the rate of growth exceeded 10%. However, that was not sustainable growth, but a bubble that had to burst at some point as the IMF and the European Union has warned it would. Uh, we had to learn from these mistakes, and we did. A series of reforms were quickly, quickly implemented in order to remedy fiscal and macroeconomic imbalances and lead Latvia back to international financial markets in a sustainable way. This uh, included ensuring the health of public finances along the lines of international loan program we negotiated at the time, structural reforms to improve our competitiveness, measures to stimulate the economy, including more effective use of EU funds, and creating a proper safety net to counter the social consequences of the crisis. All this took place uh, through intensive social dialogue and in close cooperation with Latvia's civil society. 
Far-reaching and difficult reforms can only succeed if there is a broad-based realization of ownership. However, responding to the crisis is like waking up on a board of the ship during the storm. The viability of the country is based on its ability to anticipate the future tra trends based on the lessons of history and to make the necessary reforms. To make reforms in good time rather than waiting until the storm is raging. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no denying that a return to Europe has worked uh, for our societies, companies and countries. Just to name a few examples. The regions around Bratislava and Prague are now ranked fifth and sixth richest in Europe. From automotive to fintech, the companies like Škoda, Mintas, P2P or TransferWise, Central Eastern European businesses are at the cutting edge of the forward-oriented economy. And like Riga itself, uh, cities like Kosice and Pilsen have been notably successful as European capitals of culture, and next year it's Plodius' turn. We have actively used uh, integration into the single market and for some of us into European Union, into monetary union as a spur to profound social and economic transformation. We have succeeded in making upwards convergence a reality. Over the last 25 years, the region has been catching up with the rest of Europe and average uh, incomes have more than doubled. In Latvia, GDP per capita stood at 65% of EU average in 2016, compared to below 50% in 2005. The convergence process is still taking place, uh, uh, though the financial crisis affected the speed and the pace has since been uneven across countries. We need to reinforce that momentum. For that to happen, we have to concentrate on economic policy priorities, supporting investments, structural reforms, and fiscal responsibility. Efforts to boost investment are as necessary as ever. From the onset, the European Commission has made this one of our core work strands, notably through the European Fund for Strategic Investments. Until now, EFSI has triggered 284 billion euros in investments, which is 90% of the original target, and the European Commission has increased the target to 500 billion euros. European Structural and Investment Funds, or EU Cohesion Policy, also play an important role. For this programming period, until 2020, there are 5.6 billion euros allocated for Latvia. Together with national co-financing, this amounts up to 6.9 billion euros. Most of that investment goes into transport, energy and environmental infrastructure, followed by financing to boost competitiveness of our economy, especially SMEs. These are absolutely crucial areas for economic development. However, we are living in a world which is more and more information and knowledge driven. Research and innovation are shaping our economic future. Given that funding for research and development and innovation comes only in a seventh uh, position, it's important to give it more emphasis in the next EU funding period. Currently in Latvia, around 60% of public investment come from the EU budget. Discussions on the new national envelopes have now started, linked with a post-2020 multi-annual financial framework. These discussions will be difficult in a context of Brexit and new additional priorities. We must not forget that EU funding has always meant to come in addition to countries' own uh, public spending rather uh, than al al an uh, alternative. Uh, we also need to diversify financing sources of the real economy. In addition to the bank lending, we facilitate financing from capital markets. We are working to complement banking union with capital markets union, a single market for capital for 27 countries. Our ambition is to put in place the main building blocks of the capital market union by 2019. Continued public investment and favorable climate for private investment remains one of our most important tasks uh, to succeed. This brings me to the second priority, structural reforms. Only boosting investment is not enough. In, uh, it will only result in sustainable growth and job creation if we combine it with structural reforms to strengthen the economic competitiveness. There are structural reforms to be implemented both at EU and member states level. 
At EU level, it's largely about deepening our single market, especially in areas like services, energy and digital market. The single market is Europe's strongest lever to create new opportunities for economic growth and job creation. It is also an essential ingredient for economic convergence within economic and monetary union. To name just one example, completing the digital single market could contribute 250 billion euros to our economy over the next five years and create hundreds of thousands of new jobs. Economic integration can create many opportunities. But it's these structural reforms that enable member states to grasp these opportunities and to make their economies more resilient. Thus, the main responsibility for structural reforms lies with member states. Product and services markets need to be more efficient. It is simply unacceptable that uh, people are shut out of jobs and customers are worse off because some professions remain closed. At the same time, we are calling for tax burden to be shifted from labor, especially low-paid labor, to areas that are less detrimental to growth, areas such as consumption, property or capital. Labor markets and social policy must be reformed to, so they allow working people to seize opportunities and help them uh, get their feet again, so on their feet again. In many countries, we need to address the problems of a segmented labor market with strongly protected jobs for some and very weak protections for others, mainly newcomers to the labor market. So the result is high youth unemployment in these countries, which remains one of the most pressing social problems. When dealing with uh, labor market reforms, flexicurity should be the common leitmotiv. Reforms are paying off. We saw it in the Baltic states when overcoming the crisis. It is also experience of Ireland, Portugal and Spain. All these countries had to undergo, uh, undergo very deep and popular economic reforms, but today they are among the fastest growing economies in the EU. To take a longer historical perspective, we see the importance of structural reforms by comparing our countries to Ukraine. At the time of regaining independence, Ukraine had almost the same level of economic development as Poland. In 1990s, Poland was implementing major structural reforms, so-called shock therapy. Ukraine was de develop, uh, delaying the reforms and allowed oligarchs to gradually take control of the economy. By the time of Russian invasion in 2014, Ukraine's GDP per capita had been only one third of Poland's and it has uh, since held further in relative terms. Let me now move to the third economic policy priority, fiscal responsibility. Fiscal responsibility and financial stability are preconditions for economic growth. There is no such thing as sustainable, sustainable economic growth without sustainable public finances. And we, should, we certainly should avoid repeat of the recent sovereign debt crisis. Today, the EU is in a six, uh, continued, uh, six year of continued economic growth. We should use this positive momentum, put the, uh, put the public debt on downward trajectory and build up necessary fiscal buffers to have a room for maneuver or in case of economic downturn. Coming to the future economic development, let me reiterate, our strength lies with our people. It will be determined by how successfully we will address the challenges of demographic change and emigration. One of the decisive factors to attract investors is the accessibility of qualified labor force. Surveys carried out by Foreign Investors Council in Latvia shows that the shortage of workers with the necessary skills is one of the biggest barriers to investment in Latvia. In light of these challenges, I call for energetic implementation of the European Commission's new skills agenda. It aims to make sure that people develop the skills necessary for the jobs of today and tomorrow. Actions under the new skills agenda will focus on developing basic and higher, uh, higher skills, making it easier to use and understand qualifications, including those learned outside the classroom, and providing better information on skills needed by employers. In this context, the Latin authorities' intention to roll out a competences-based general education curriculum to align skills with future labor market needs is very welcome step. Ladies and gentlemen, as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of our countries, the lessons we draw should be a guiding light setting our future policy agenda. 
Independence uh, gives us decision-making power we deserve. It is, uh, offers us opportunities we desire. It remains up to us to reap those opportunities through the hard work we have done so in the past. To stay successful in fast-changing world, we need to be able to embrace and lead the change once again. And I have no doubt that we will. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very broad picture, a very insightful speech. Um, many decades ago, the outstanding Latvian poet Trainis concluded an article devoted to the 10th University of Latvia with a prophetic warning. Latvians, do safeguard the democratic political system. Should it fall, the independent national state will go down with it. Our former president of Latvia, Madame Vaira Vita Freiberka, has not only protected Latvia's democracy, she has also made it stronger. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President of Club de Madrid, uh, ex-president of the Republic of Latvia, laureate of numerous awards and honorary doctorate degrees, member of 30 international organizations, Madame Vairavita Freiberga. Madam Chairman, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I should like to address the context of our centenary with a very broad sweep over what we mean by these hundred past years and why we are particularly now uh, extraordinarily concerned about the next hundred. Time flows like a river. Uh, you stick a finger in it uh, in the water and it's not leaving, going to leave a mark. The only way you can mark the passage of time is by various indices around you. In other words, in human affairs, those will be events, obviously, historical events, historical changes. But it so happens that historical changes never happen by accident. Uh, they never happened spontaneously, as in spontaneous generation. They have causes, and not only causes, but a multiplicity of causes which collide in a, sometimes in a random Brownian movement and sometimes in something that maybe chaos theory might try to explain, but they are there. And among them are ideas and values of which we already have uh, heard from our previous speakers this morning. It is these uh, that I'd like to address briefly uh, this morning with you. We are celebrating a centenary roughly covering uh, the 20th century Although yesterday, nor was it a few days ago, on the 4th of May, we also uh, celebrated uh, a second independence. We had our first uh, independence, uh, the declaration of the Latvian state on November 18, 1918. That is our national day. But when on the 4th of May, uh, a television journalist addressed a lady on the street, uh, and, uh, or at the celebration for the event, asking her which was more important to her, the 4th of May, which is a declaration of renewed independence and a desire to separate from the Soviet Union. She says, oh, uh, I don't know much about the 18th. Uh, I know about the 4th. That's the one that's important because I was there. I saw it. And it's very uh, understandable from a human point of view. Uh, a person who has gone through and participated uh, in historical events <clears throat> will have those particular events deeply marked in their brain and in their heart, uh, whereas others are rather abstract. But from that abstract point of view, of course, she wasn't quite right, uh, since we wouldn't have celebrated uh, a 4th of May <clears throat> unless there had been an 18th of November in 1918 before. 
And so in order to understand what is happening today or what will happen tomorrow, uh, we do, I think, uh, have advantage to look back and this is why the title of this conference, unless I'm wrong, is 100 plus or minus another 100. And with your permission, I'd like to go back to what some consider uh, as the beginning of the modern era in Europe, and that is the Congress of Vienna after Napoleon's conquests uh, and the changes he brought to Europe had come to an end. Uh, when uh, we were celebrating a few years ago the bicentenary of the Congress of Vienna all across Europe, including Vienna, where I was present in the very room where it, was, uh, where it occurred, the idea was that the Congress of Vienna had been a great success. Uh, it had established peace after these uh, terrible Napoleonic wars. Uh, it had established an equilibrium between powers that offered some hope of stability. And the statesmen participating there were truly enlightened, uh, did their best under the circumstances, and ensured an uh, ensuing 100 years of peace and stability in Europe. Well, as I had occasion to uh, remind historians and others, um, that century between the Vienna Congress and the start of the First World War in 1914 was, alas, not that island of peace, stability, and, uh, and prosperity uh, for Europe uh, that for simplicity's sake sometimes is attributed to it. Uh, those of you who remember your, your high school history, if nothing else, will know <clears throat> that in, 19, uh, in 1848 there were a number of serious uprisings in various parts of Europe. There was great social discontent. There was unhappiness in many quarters not the least among which uh, the populations of what are now the three Baltic countries of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, where uh, under the existing regime, uh, under the oppression of the Tsarist regime, uh, the fate of the native populations, and when I say native, I do mean those who had been living there and whose ancestors had been living there for a couple of thousand years at the very least. And there, they were the last ones considered in the 19th century. If you read the, the press uh, in, in Latvia, it would be the Baltic German press of the time. Um, there are some hair-raising quotes that I could uh, present you, but I'll spare you, you can imagine. Uh, the idea being that some nations, such as the Latvians, were predestined by a mysterious fate uh, to be uh, servants uh, and second-class citizens, and they certainly did not have what it takes to constitute a nation. That privilege belonged to others, notably, of course, the ones writing in their own language and the ones who did happen to have social and economic power uh, in that region at that time. Now, that is a, a rather um, heavy uh, way of putting it, but that is precisely the kind of language that was used. The conclusion I draw from that is that the language we use, the ideas we express, is intimately linked to the events that that is going to provoke. And what this sort of attitude towards, in the case of Latvia, the Latvian peasants provoked, were revolts starting in the end of the 18th century a particularly serious revolt in 1802 in Kauguri, and peasants rising up and saying, we have heard, we have had news, we are literate, we can read, that a country like France that had a king and was a powerful country deposed that king because they considered he was unjust towards his people. The French Revolution, therefore, had echoes all the way over to the Baltic countries. And these echoes stimulated people to start thinking about liberté, égalité, fraternité as ideas, not just abstract ideas to put uh, on a flag or to wave around, but ideas to be realized in real life, in practice. 
When the war started in 1914, Latvians were drafted into the Tsarist army. They fought valiantly. They fought remarkably. But they fought under Tsarist uniforms. It took some time after the, 19, uh, the 1917 revolution, the October Revolution, for the Red uh, Riflemen to start drifting back to Latvia, laying off their uh, communist uh, allegiances or socialist allegiances, as they would call it at the time, and to join an independent Latvian army. When you look at the circumstances under which the Latvian state was born and declared in 1918, you could hardly put together a less favorable scenario for a positive outcome. If you wanted uh, to bet on the outcome in terms of probabilities and likelihoods of such an adventure bringing uh, an outcome such as the participants desired, I think that statistically, mathematically, logically, you would say this is a pipe dream. These people have a beautiful dream of having a country, of being a nation, of having their say over their native land, to become masters in their own home, as they put it at the time. And many would say this is impossible. Because after all, the Western powers wanted stability in this part of the world. The only concern they had was whether the Reds or the Whites would be winning in Russia and how this would influence their interests and their relationships with this part of Europe. At the very beginning of events, they hardly had a thought uh, for the populations living on the ground because they were small and nobody had ever heard about them before. And therefore, they didn't seem important. The 20th century brought 20 years for these nations to somehow sort of wave and say to Europe, hello, we are here, we exist, we live, we breathe, we paint, we make music, uh, uh, we have talents. Uh, curiously enough, uh, we're much like you, um, uh, only we have lived under different circumstances, but frankly, different circumstances maybe from the British uh, and the French court, not necessarily that terribly different from the circumstances of the crofters in Scotland, uh, of some of the uh, uh, peasants the, uh, in the uh, great estates uh, of Britain, uh, or the peasants in some uh, remote regions of France. Actually, the difference was not all that great. But then, of course, came the Second World War, the results that we know, the split of Europe in half, and the rebirth after half a century. And well, half a century is a long time, but better late than never. And of course, all of us, beyond the Iron Curtain, of that did stand there, quite literally, I saw it, I remember, on the border with uh, what was then Czechoslovakia. It was an extraordinary, uh, physically visible border there. So it was uh, in the middle of Berlin and, and elsewhere. That came down. Europe was reunited. Europe could take a sigh of relief, but Europe had to also reorient themselves. We heard from previous speakers the tasks uh, that a country like Latvia had before it and continues to have for the next century, which is already well started. We're in 2018. So it's well started already. But these people were not well known to their neighbors, to their fellow Europeans on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Now, over 20 years have passed, longer than between the two world wars. But there are still blanks on the mental map of Europeans. And I think it's a task of the next hundred years, among the many things that we already heard, very concrete, important, practical, necessary things that we need to do, not just in the next hundred years, but in the very near future, the next decades, we do have, I do believe, to have adjust our mental maps. And if we want to have a strong Europe, 
and a Europe that in the next century will be stronger than it has ever, ever been before, remotely like it in previous history, then we have to start working on our ideas, on our concepts, on the way we look at things, on the way we interpret inter uh, information, propaganda, and so on. It is quite a challenge and quite a task. Writing a, a chapter for a book for the centenary, I came across a quotation from a German historian uh, who said uh, in an interview to a journalist, I must tell you that uh, for the average German, of course, uh, the average whatever is a mythical entity, but for the average German, says he, uh, Ukraine is just a blank spot on the map. And this after, well, more than one year since the invasion and the illegal annexation of part of that country. And for an educated population like the Germans, it seems to me a rather serious indictment either of their intelligence or of their ability to follow events if after all these tragic events, Ukraine continues to be a blank on their mental maps. Two days ago, I had an encounter with a young lady who is French, uh, who will be interviewing me when they're at the Quai d'Orsay. We are going to have uh, various events in honor of the centenary of the three Baltic countries. And she offered me a book uh, she had written about Lithuania in French in order to acquaint the French with this country in which she had been living for the past 10 years. So she's talking to her fellow uh, countrymen in France, your average Frenchman, I suppose, uh, and I uh, looked with great interest on the back cover of how uh, this, you might say, specialist of Lithuania uh, was presenting that country to her fellow citizens in France. And the first sentence read, and it's difficult to translate exactly, but it says something like this. Lithuania is a tiny country on the very outskirts of Europe. Thank you very much for the compliment. Uh, and then in the text, uh, she has interviews in there, which are quite interesting with various personalities in Lithuania. But in her own introduction, she says, um, uh, Lithuania hasn't got a clue uh, about the image that it has. And its governments have been muddling around, uh, trying to determine, is Lithuania the land of uh, flax and linen? Is it the land of amber? Uh, is it the land of uh, energy or whatever else? They haven't a clue about their image. And I read that and I said to myself, well, this business of having an image about the country, true enough, it's not simple. I, I myself, personally, having <laughs> grown up in a French colony and being rather immersed in French culture, if you asked me what is the image of France, I'd have a bit of difficulty saying, is France the country of cheese or is France the country of wine? Do they have a clue about who they are? I do believe, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that well-intentioned as such attempts might be, are frankly intellectually dangerous. They're dangerous because intellectual laziness and oversimplification has too often led uh, to, to the sort of excesses of which Europe in the 20th century has shown horrifying examples. Just think of the rise of Nazism in Germany, uh, the country that since the 19th century had been a leader in scientific progress in Europe, the country that had, uh, together with Austria, probably the best and most renowned composers in the whole of Europe, a country where every, at least middle-class family, had a piano and could play it and could sing the songs of Schubert, uh, uh, around uh, uh, their uh, fireplace. And this is the country that invented Nazism, the Holocaust, and everything that followed. And it happened quickly. 
it happened very fast. Uh, it had a long history since the Middle Ages of cultural development. And all of a sudden, the cultural veneer cracked, fell down, and brutality and inhumanity appeared in its place. As a psychologist, I can tell you this is not a unique characteristic of the German people. And we will not have solved the problem by stigmatizing some nations rather than others and saying they are uh, inclined to violence, uh, to injustice, to oppression, etc. I do believe as a psychologist that I can tell you with, with complete conviction, human nature is the same everywhere. It's the conditions and the circumstances and the values and the societal attitudes and the laws and the uh, conventions that people adopt that will make a difference between brutality and solidarity, kindness uh, and justice uh, between civilization and uh, barbarity. So in the next century, ladies and gentlemen, it is not so much a question of concretely what we will do, because this is something that will be happening by itself. We will be forced to address the problem of youth unemployment. The world will not allow us to ignore the technological process uh, and the uh, changes and the advances that will create more and more robots that will be replacing more and more among us and making us redundant. And if we have enormous youth unemployment now already in the south of Europe, we can envisage a time when having a job at all of any kind is going to be a privilege, how then are we going to manage uh, our societies? What are we going to do about the financial crises that hit us supposedly in, uh, in uh, capitalist societies where capital and the market forces, uh, um, the invisible hand of the market, uh, invisible indeed, totally absent when it comes to having any kind of uh, decent control, uh, when the market obviously is so invisible as to completely be inoperative uh, and big crises happen and, uh, and we are stuck politically and socially with the consequences. The one thing you can be sure of, there will be more of that in the future. So therefore we will have to face it. And extremism uh, was present in Europe in the last century among these piano playing Schubert singing people. So do not be surprised if you see uh, extremism in people who live in harsh mountain or desert conditions or elsewhere. Obviously, you are going to have it both in wild surroundings and so-called civilized ones. You scratch the veneer of civilization and if people are scared, if they have lost their job, if they have lost their home, if they have lost their hope about the future, if they are not convinced that their children are going to live better, then people are subject to influences that can lead them off the path of democracy, off the path of rule of law and all the beautiful things that we subscribe to in Europe, rightly so, and which we should follow. Uh, by accident, I, I picked up a book uh, about the uh, various methods of influencing minds, um, uh, especially uh, without their uh, awareness. We are, as you know, one of the concerns of the future is how these mental maps that we form, and when I say mental maps, I don't mean just geographical, but about what's what, who's who, what's right and what's wrong in the world. These kind of cognitive maps that we have in our heads are extremely important. And we, if we have um, malicious ways of influencing without us even being aware, it's very dangerous. And lo and behold, I look at the list of uh, scientific studies that have been used in this book, and I see Leclerc C and Freiburg's V, 1971, uh, Canadian Journal of Psychology, uh, a study 50 years old, but it, which seems to be very timely, uh, which looks at subliminal sim uh, stimulation uh, and uh, its effects on concept formation. This is going to be, uh, which it, uh, it was Partly 50 years ago, it, this is reborn, about what influences us uh, both with our awareness and without our awareness. Ladies and gentlemen, the next 100 years are going to bring challenges as all the 100 years before. In that, they're not going to be different. 
they're going to be different in a manner this will happen. The best way to build a house is to put it on solid foundations. This century and the decades we have just lived, I feel Latvia has been working on the foundations of a modern state renewed, reborn, and ready to face whatever the future is to bring. My hope is that the same commitment, the same conviction, and the same desire for a civilized and humanistic world will infuse us all, our neighbors north, south, east, and north. All of us in Europe, whether we're in the Union or not, whether we're in the Eurozone or not, that, in fact, the rest of the world would be swayed to move in that direction. But it will not happen by itself. It will need convinced people, people who know what they think, why they think it, who have some idea of history, who have some idea of what the world is about and what is there, what is out there, not blank spaces, but real, what really is there. And with that, as a starting point, I think we have a good chance. So let us hope that all of us together, we can build a century that's much better than the one before. Ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me with the speakers like we already heard, this conference should be indeed considered as a gift to all of us to the centenary. Uh, but it is also a unique opportunity for all of us because uh, we have been able to get together and we will be able to discuss and to build bridges. And who can be as uh, a better negotiator and builder of bridges between nations and between countries and between people than the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, it is my honor and pleasure to give the floor to Minister of Foreign Affairs of Republic of Latvia, Mr. Edgar Srinkevich. Augsti godātais ministru prezidenta kungs, jau cienījumā Vairvīčas Freibargas kundzes, Dombrovska kungs, Šteinbukas kundze. Jāsaka, ka būt pēdējām ir mazliet privilēģi un mazliet izaicinājums, jo viss jau ir pateikts, gan par vēsturi, gan par nākotni, gan par lietām, kas mūs visus rūp. Tas ir tas, kur mēs šobrīd esam, kā Latvija, kā Eiropas Savienība, kā NATO. Un, manuprāt, ka atskatoties simts gadu ilgā pagātnē, mēs varam teikt, ka savā ziņā ir zinām līdzības starp to, kas notika 1918. gadā un nākamajās dekādēs, un arī pašlaik. Pēc pirmā pasaules kara Latvija, Igaunija, Lietuva, daudz austrumu Eiropas valsts ieguva savu neatkarību, sabrūkot veselai rindai, Impērija un lielā mērā arī, protams, diezgan asiņainās cīņās. Tai pašā laikā, uzreiz pēc tam, diemžēl tā laika Latvijas varas vīriem, tāpat kā Eiropas varas vīriem un valsts vīriem, vajadzēja nodarboties ar divu problēmu risināšanu. Pēc lielās depresijas milzīgu demokrātijas deficītu, lielā mērā populismu ekstrēmismu, un ļoti, ļoti naidīgi ideoloģiju parādīšanos. Otra lieta – ārpus Eiropas kultūra tāpas un juridiskās un politiskās tāpas esošu valstu vēlmi izaicināt starptautisko tiesību un starptautisko sistēmu un lietu kārtību. Manuprāt, skan ļoti, ļoti līdzīgi situācijas aprakstam, kādu mēs redzam arī šodien. Arī šodien mēs redzam, ka pēc pasaucamās lielās recesijas, 
Ir ļoti daudz un dažādas gan labēji, gan kreisi tendētas ekstrēmistu un populistu kustības, kas uzskata, ka visu, ko mēs esam darījuši, veidojuši Eiropas Savienību, veidojuši NATO, veidojuši demokrātiju, būtams ir jāizmet miskastē, ka mēs varam runāt par kaut kādu dīvainu vertikālu vai neliberālu demokrātiju, ka mēs varam runāt, ka cilvēku tiesības nav universāls, bet katrai kultūrai un nācijai savas, ka likuma vara ir kaut kas ļoti specifisks, katrā valstī atkal ļoti īpašs. Un mēs redzam arī valstis, kas cenšās izaicināt esošo lietu kārtības starptautiski, kaut vai notikumu, kas notiek šobrīd Ukrainā, kas notiek Sīrijā, un patiesību sakot, kas notiek pasaulē. Savā ziņā līdzības ir. Pēc otrā pasaules kara Eiropas Savienība un NATO lielā mērā tik izveidoti kā zināmi drošinātāji, zināmi garanti tam, lai lielā mērā runātu par šīm divām problēmām, lai stiprinātu katras valsts demokrātiju, noturību un lielā mērā, lai veicinātu arī Eiropas kontinentā mieru, drošību un stabilitāti. Un Eiropas Savienība un NATO ir bijuši ļoti veiksmīgi projekti. Varbūt pat pārāk veiksmīgi, jo šobrīd ļoti daudz no mums uzskata daudzas lietas par pašsaprotamām. Savu laiku sabrūkot padojumu Savienībai, Beidzoties augstajam karam un Latvijai atgūstot neatkarību, mūsu lielais sapnis bija pievienošanās Eiropas Savienībā un NATO, un dažreiz likās tas ir tālu neiespējami, un tomēr ar ļoti lielu, smagu darbu, ļoti lielām reformām mēs to paveicām. Paveicām vēsturiski ļoti īsā laikā. Tajā pašā laikā mēs arī redzam, ka ir ļoti daudz šobrīd cilvēku, kas vēlās, šo veiksmes stāstu pārskatīt, kas uzskata, ka ir nepieciešams runāt par kaut kādām jaunām pārvaldības formām un lielā mērā notiek arī uzbrukums mūsu kopīgo vērtību un arī Eiropas projektām. Ministra prezidents runāja par trim principiem – par konverģenci, par solidaritāti un lielā mērā arī par kritisko domāšanu. Jāsaka, ka latvietim vēsturiski piemitusi ļoti spēcīgi kritiskā domāšana. Vai no 16. gadsimtā mums ļoti negribējās ieviest jaunu kalendāru vai 19. gadā mums nepatika kartupēt? Es pilnībā piekrītu, ka mums ir jābūt pietiekami kritiskiem pret daudzām lietām, Mums ir jāveicina sabiedrības kritiskā domāšana, kaut vai cīnoties ar informācijas kara elementiem, ar propagandu, bet vienlaikus mūsu nākotni ir iespējami arī tad, ja mēs esam pietiekami radoši. Ja mēs atvērti diskutējam par lietām, kas ir uzlabojamas Latvijā, un arī par tām lietām, kas stiprina kopā Eiropas Savienību un arī Ziemeļa Atlantijas līguma organizāciju. Un šeit nav lielu, ģeniālu recepšu vai projektu kādā veidā, uzlabot mūsu savienību, kādā veidā uzlabot mūsu Latvijas valsts pārvaldi un tās elementus, bet drīzāk šeit ir daudzi, mazi, bet būtiski darbi darāmi. Un tāpēc man ir prieks, ka šobrīd diskutējot par Eiropas nākotni, mēs daudz runājam par kopīgu aizsardzības politiku, mēs daudz runājam par digitālo tirgu un digitālā tirgu satīstību, par enerģētikas savienību, Arī par transportu tīku latīstību, bet ir viena lieta, kas mums arī ir jāsaprot. Mēs institucionāli esam kļuvuši par daļu no Eiropas. Mums jāļauj arī Eiropai ienākt Latvijā, mums latviešiem, un šeit arī ir ļoti interesants visraks šai konferencei, grūti iztūkojams, grūti saprotams. Bet arī latviešiem bieži vien un Latvijā ir tāds ļoti labs teiciens atbildot uz kādu priekšlikumu, mēs sakam, nē, nu jā. Un tad nu mēģiniet saprast, vai tas ir nē, vai tas ir jā. Manuprāt, ka mums daudz biežāk un daudz vairāk ir jābūt atvērtiem šajā diskusijā. Jāsaka jā un jāskatās, kā mēs varam uzlabot savu valstu nākamajos simts gados, kā mēs varam uzlabot Eiropas Savienību. Un to es arī novēlu jums šajā diskusijā, šajā konferencē divas dienas pirms Eiropas dienas, ko mēs visi svinēsim kopā. Paldies! Ladies and gentlemen, let me express my sincere gratitude to all distinguished panelists, to all distinguished speakers for your time and for your really inspiring 
inspiring wishes uh, uh, to all our 10 countries and to the whole Europe uh, uh, on the centenary. But in the end of this plenary session, I would like to draw your attention to this publication. Uh, the book which actually uh, c covered our today's discussion, uh, partly you already heard the uh, interventions of the speakers and the next discussion will follow. But what is interesting, it seems to me, that the book cover has already been a subject of discussion because when I personally looked first at this uh, painting, I had different ideas, and one of my ideas was actually that it's similar to MFF, multi-annual financial framework, Well, all of European countries are trying to get a piece of cake. Uh, the other people suggested that it is abstract painting, painting, but in fact, the artist has depicted the abduction of Europe. Uh, of course, in a contemporary way. And this was a story of love, passion, legend, and at the same time showing us uh, Europe's important cultural heritage. I very much hope that in the next hundred years, no one will abduct Europe. So our Europe will remain uh, united, integrated. It will remain our hope, our future, our dream, and our reality, our peace and prosperity. So thank you again, dear speakers, for your contributions, and uh, let the discussion begin. I invite Professor Janeta Wozolinia and her panel to take the floor. Thank you. Enjoy the discussion.